but which I know and see. There is the body or the realm of the gods of streaming radiance from which you passed away and reappeared here. You have been reborn in this realm after passing away from the realm of streaming radiance. So according to what the Buddha is saying, in his previous life, Brahma had dwelt amongst the gods of streaming radiance. Then when his karma was exhausted, he passed away there and he took rebirth as the chief of the Brahma world. So why doesn't Brahma remember this? The Buddha says, because you have dwelt here for a long time, your memory of that has lapsed and thus you do not know it or see it, but I know and see it. Therefore, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge or abhinya, superior knowledge, I don't stand merely at the same level of, of you. I'm saying this. I don't stand merely at the same level as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. Okay, so now the Buddha is showing that he is aware of the realm of streaming radiance, which Brahma has forgotten. But now the Buddha is going to point out that there are realms even higher than that of streaming radiance. He says there is the body or realm called the gods of refulgent glory. Again, you do not, um, you do not know about it, but I know and see it. Then there is the body or realm called the gods of great fruit. You do not know it or see it, but I know it and see it. Therefore, Brahma, in regard to direct knowledge, I do not stand merely at the same level of you as you. How then could I know less? Rather, I know more than you. What, what do we make out of this? Yeah. I'm still formulating. Anybody have any ideas about this? Maybe it's good if you take the microphone. Do we have a... It's okay. I wonder, where does Mara fit into this? Yeah, interesting question. The question is, where does Mara fit into this? In the old text, you know, the text, the suttas themselves, the dwelling place of Mara is not explicitly mentioned. But what the commentaries say, the Pali commentaries, <coughs> You see, in the sense sphere, there are six, this is the realm of the gods, then there are six realms of sense sphere gods. The highest of them is called the realm, what's, how does it look called? The realm of the gods who exercise control over the creation of others. The fifth realm are the Nimana Rati gods, the gods who delight in their own creations. These gods are able to create whatever they want just through an exercise of will and then they delight in what they create. But the Parani Vasavati Devas, those are the gods who exercise control over the creation of others. They sort of take over the things that are created by the other gods and control them. I don't really know what that means in actual experience. I sometimes think that that is a realm where movie producers, book editors, literary agents, <laughs> music producers get reborn. They don't have the creative talents, but they control the creations of others. Okay, and so it's said that Mara lives in the sixth realm. 
the realm of the gods who control the creation of others, but he lives there like a rebellious prince in a kingdom. You know, he has an argument with his father. The prince wants to get control of the realm. The father won't let him. And so the prince retreats to a remote region within the kingdom together with his rebel forces and he tries to launch attacks against the king. It's just like Satan. Lucifer rebelled against. Yeah. Lucifer I, rebelled against God. Actually, that is very, very And was exiled with his lieutenants yeah. Yeah. his captains. Yeah, that's interesting. Very, yeah. I wonder if this idea came... I don't know the Zoroastrianism very much. In fact, I don't know it almost not at all. But I wonder if that idea could have spread from Persia eastwards to India and affected the thinking of the Pali commentators and then move from Persia southwest to, um, to the Middle East and then affected Judea or Christian thinking. Is that in the Old Testament? Um, in the Old Testament, the Satan was actually he was known as the accuser. Mm -hmm. It was almost like a job. It was a little bit of a diff. He wasn't really, he wasn't in his form as, you know, Beelzebub or, you know, really evil or anything like that. He was more like, he was an angel whose job it was to accuse and point out things and every so often report back to heaven. Because mm -hmm. if you look at some of the Old Testament, you know, Satan comes into heaven. He actually is allowed into heaven and God's like, so where have you been? What have you been doing? Oh, walking the earth. So you really think Job's so great? That's what. That's yeah, what I remember. Yeah. Satan. Right, yeah, so he had a, a different. Um, yeah. it, Satan evolved over the years. Yeah. As the stories got you know yeah. mishmashed together. Any other thoughts on this? On Satan or the passage? On this passage. This is what it's. It's hard for me to articulate this, but this is. Um, it was just, it just reminds me so much of, okay, the Enlightenment. There's the Western Enlightenment where people finally broke free of dependence on gods and really looking at their own selves to, you know, for knowledge. And, mm -hmm. and here's the Buddha really sort of in, in a proto way doing this. It's a mm -hmm. different culture, but it's, it's almost sort of smashing the gods in a sense. Well, that's nice. You're really not so great. Mm -hmm. And it's almost teaching, I'm not articulating this well, I'm still formulating yeah. this, but um, it's almost like, like, like proto-enlightenment thought. Don't, don't, don't be some superstitious little, you know, get who's running and squirming, you know, yeah. towards these gods and let them control you. You, you, you are the key in the way. It's up to you. Yeah, except I would say that there is this, let me just sort of summarize mm -hmm. your position for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Andrea is saying that the Buddha's position here is somewhat like the Enlightenment position since the thinkers of the European Enlightenment rejected the theistic beliefs of Christianity or claims of Christianity. Some of them were deists who believed that God just created the universe according to certain laws, then it unfolded according to these laws. Others were agnostics, others were explicitly atheists who denied the existence of any creator God. So she says that the Buddha, in a way, is saying that, sort of smashing this belief in the gods and saying that you look within yourself, what is within yourself is important. What I would say is that there is certainly that aspect, but the Buddha is not actually He's not rejecting the existence of these realms. No, no, I didn't say he was yeah, but, rejecting. Yeah, but he's just rejecting the claim that those in these realms, or at least Brahma, make about themselves. So he's sort of exposing the delusions with which they sustain themselves. Neil, you know, that's something. Well, to take off on that, it also strikes me that what he seems to be saying to this Brahma is you know, even at the highest level of all these realms, many of which you don't even know about, yeah. all of these beings are still subject to karma and still subject to rebirth. Oh, uh, that's a very good point. And so, I so see let me just summarize that. I see all this because I'm on the outside of it because I'm bored. 
Yeah, okay, what he's, he said is that um, from the Buddhist perspective, all of these realms, even the realms that are beyond the knowledge, beyond the scope of Brahma's knowledge, are still within the realm of karma and rebirth. Since the Buddha can see how beings pass away from those realms and take rebirth elsewhere. His audience, though, is, is, is not the, just the Brahma. His audience is the, the bhikkhus. Well, he's relating this. Ah, that's story. a very good point. Yeah, he's and, and so he's trying to say, don't be tempted by these other points of view, even though yeah. they, they, they might be very tempting. Uh, and, that, I, and I'm at a higher level than this. Uh, this is a very, very good point. Yeah, something I never thought so, of. So, you know, yeah. I'm at a higher level, and so don't be sucked into this. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, temp yeah. Temptation. In fact, this is something we almost lose sight of because the sutta is presented it starts to take on the form of a dialogue or a trilogue between Buddha, Brahma, and Mara. So we lose sight of the fact that the Buddha is actually speaking to the, to the monks. And so the kind of message that's being conveyed to the monks is that, you know, one shouldn't be uh, sort of attracted, take up these views that these divine or celestial realms are permanent and eternal and one shouldn't be attracted to the prospect of rebirth in these realms, since existence in these realms is impermanent, and even the sort of the sovereign divinities in those realms are inferior in knowledge to myself, since I'm outside the entire conditioned world. Wouldn't it also lead to suffering, if you, if you, if you accepted that point? Of view? Yeah, I think we're going to come to that later in the sutta, but I don't want to sort of jump the gun by Getting beyond what we've covered. Tracy? I'm also, uh, sorry, I'm struck by the way he says, I did not claim to be Earth. I did not claim to be in Earth. It's I almost like. That, that's sort of like getting into the next section. Oh. Go. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm wondering about one thing. If Mara, who has such big wrong view, but he is in the deity world. Yeah. And uh, I'm wondering what kind of wrong view you human being have. <laughs> I have to say the position of Mara, it's a little problematic in terms of locating him precisely within this scheme of the universe. And it's just really the commentaries that say that Brahma occupies part of the Deva world. But in the old text, Brahma is not, oh, I'm sorry, Mara is not placed in any specific realm. So that exactly the nature of Mara, is, again, it's a little problematic whether, in fact, there's a certain ambiguity about the nature of Mara. Is he just a symbol for, let us say, for the defilements like craving and ignorance? Or is he, truly a separate deity, you know, existing someplace who tempts human beings. And there are passages in the suttas that one could sort of pick out and say, this shows that Mara is really a symbol for the temptations of craving or the delusions due to ignorance. But then there are other passages where Mara tries to attack and uh, mislead the Buddha after his enlightenment. So, since the Buddha is enlightened, free of craving and ignorance, then if Mara was just a symbol of craving and ignorance, he couldn't be addressing the Buddha. But then the fact that we have suttas like that doesn't mean that these were actual historical events. You know, they can be partly metaphorical, partly literary, uh, creations in order to uh, again, again convey a particular point. Because when Mara challenges the Buddha, <coughs> again he's usually taking the point, one of the standpoints that things are permanent, so delight in them, things can give you true enjoyment, so enjoy them, things are yourself, so identify with them. And then the Buddha always addresses Mara by saying, no, that's not permanent, that's impermanent. No, that's not blissful, but really suffering. No, this is not self. 
but not self. So the dramatic dialogue gives an opportunity to assert the Buddha's point of view in a rather way that you say has a certain aesthetic and literary appeal to it. You know, if you just get sermons, form is impermanent, suffering is impermanent, uh, form is impermanent, feeling is impermanent, perceptions, mental activities, consciousness is impermanent. You know, it gets a little uh, tedious. But if you have a dialogue where somebody is trying to appeal to the Buddha, convince him it's permanent, it's pleasurable itself, then the Buddha responds, no, it's impermanent, dukkha, unsatisfactory, non-self, becomes you know, <coughs> exciting, <laughs> like a good TV drama. I have a question. Was the Bible really telling what he believed or he is liar? It seems from the sutta that he's saying what he believes. What makes you think that he's lying? He has, con at least to some extent, he, he, he is concerned Buddha is correct, so he lost his grip. So to a certain extent, he, 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 he is concerned the Dharma is true. I think he's definitely concerned about that, maybe worried about that. But I think at this point, he hasn't yet acknowledged that the Buddha is right. And that will come a little, a little bit later in the sutta. The way I see it, maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's the way I see it. <clears throat> Anybody else have any ideas? Okay, let me see what some of the questions that come through the internet. Okay. This is question one. It seems to me that the Buddha often does take on this attitude of disgust to the world. Um, for example, there is the meditation on the, what's called the foulness of the body. There's also the teaching on cultivating what's called the sense of disgust towards samsara. Is this view legitimate? Actually, there is a certain point in that. Um, But what I would say is that this is the kinds of strategies that the Buddha uses in order to overcome, it's, the purpose is not to generate the disgust itself, but say in regard to the contemplation of the body, the parts of the body, the purpose is to overcome sensual craving or sensual lust by seeing the body as it is. And in regard to, I don't think we use the term the sense of disgust towards samsara, but it's called anabhivratta, sabaloke anabhivratta, which means the sense of non-delight in all the world. Again, it's, the purpose is to turn the mind away from delighting in the things of the world in order to seek nibbana or liberation. Okay, in relation to question one, please ask Bhante about the Pali words Nibbita and Viraga, do they both mean dispassion? Okay, first the words that he used in the sutta for disgust. The word that's used for disgust is called Jigucha, which is not a word that the Buddha uses in his own teaching, in relation to his own practice. Jigucha is yeah, it corresponds closely to the English word disgust. And this was a kind of practice that was taken up by the ascetics of his time to develop this disgust towards the body and towards things of the world. But the Buddha uses the two words, nibbita and viraga. Nibbita comes, if you take it etymologically, it means finding out. Like, finding out the truth of, of things. But the way it functions, I, I translate it as disenchantment. It means that when you find the true nature of things, that all of these phenomena are permanent, connected with suffering and non-self, 
then one becomes disenchanted with them and is ready to turn away from them to seek liberation. And then viraga is the word that could be translated as dispassion. Literally it means the fading away of a bright color. So it's the mind saturated with lust is like a mind brightened by a color and then viraga is the fading out of that bright color. So that comes to mean dispassion. A question Okay, somebody says, to really break the dogmatic creator God beliefs and seek higher knowledge, it seems that direct experience of the four jhanas and the higher states through meditation practice is mandatory. I mean, I don't want to get into <laughs> the discussion about that point now. Okay. Is the Tathagata Garbha and the Buddha nature concept predominant in Mahayana Buddhism the same as the Brahma, Bra, Brahman's <coughs> Mahabrahma idea in disguise? They sound a lot like what the Brahma proclaims. I don't see a, such a close connection between the Tathagata Garbha and what Mahabrahma is claiming here. Mahabrahma is claiming to be an individual being who is permanent and everlasting. And he's claiming that his world is permanent and everlasting. So there do seem to be some connections or similarities between what is called Tathagata Garbha, or this is sometimes called Buddha nature, and the Atman or Brahman of Vedantic philosophy. But there are also subtle differences between them. But again, to go into the details, it's beyond my capability here. Okay, we'll end here, and then we'll take the rest of the sutta next time. We'll have the class next week. I'll have to make up the schedule for the coming months and send it out. We'll try to do that tomorrow. Okay, let us end with the sharing of the merits.